Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. It's a blessing to see you all. We thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have another opportunity to open the Word of God together. Um, and I think we should cherish these moments. Um, we are told in counsel, and as well as the Bible makes it very clear that there will be one day when we will be hated of all nations. Um, and I've learned in my life, I, I don't even like being hated or disliked by one person, but to be hated by all nations and hated for doing good. Uh, something that you should really consider and also seek to prepare for that time frame. Um, you know, a lot happens inside the mind. You know, usually when something happens outwardly, we say, okay, that's the response. But for many, a lot takes place inside. You may never see someone explode, but inside, they've exploded. And what we'll learn is unless Christ ultimately changes our heart, then the crisis that we are approaching, we will not be ready for. All that you're seeing in television or in the news, you have to be reminded that the purpose behind it all, uh, Satan's purpose behind it all, is to bring about a national Sunday law. It's not for this group to fight. It's not for those people to fight. It's not for those people to disagree. All of the foolishness and all of the little conspiracies and all the little things happening, you need to be reminded that Satan's goal and desire ultimately still is Sunday law. Bottom line, the small pockets of issues are just to get us to that point. Those are not the real issues. Um, I think of, have you ever heard of the term smoke screen? Yes. Yes. You know, smoke screens are really effective, brothers and sisters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they don't use smoke screens because they don't work. They don't use decoys because they don't work. They actually use them because they are extremely effective. And the saddest part would be if the decoy is something that catches our attention and we're off focus. So with that, we're going to have a word of prayer. We're going to do part two of living with the curse. And then uh, my desire will be to ultimately go right back into the trumpets. I'll do a small review. Uh, And then we will go back into the trumpets. But I I do want to finish up what we started last week on living with the curse. So with that, we're going to have a word of prayer. And then I'm going to begin our study. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father. As we come to you in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you so much for your patience with us, for not treating us as we deserve, and we just want to humble ourselves as we look at our own lives and we think about how we treat one another, what our thoughts are about one another, and what our feelings are. And Lord, oftentimes we don't fully realize that you are calling us to love one another but we harbor evil feelings and thoughts towards one another. We don't realize, Lord, that it will be impossible to love one another without forsaking those thoughts. As you have stated by your prophet Isaiah, let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return, Lord. May we always be clear that as long as we keep our own thoughts, we have left you. May our hearts be open to return today. May we be willing to give up our thoughts about other people and think about them the way you think about them. With unconditional love and regard, with a desire to always serve and pardon. Lord, this is how you think of us. But Lord, we have our own opinions. We have our own ideas. And Lord, we are so often unwilling to give them up. We want to hold things to people and judge them based upon what we have seen and not based upon love. We need your help. Lord, we're asking for your Holy Spirit today to make things clear. We don't want to be a part of an ecumenical movement that destroys true religion. We want to be a part of the movement that brings the fall of Babylon. That brings not only the fall of Babylon, but it also brings first the fall of an evil character. May you 
Give us your spirit this day. May we seek to understand, but also to surrender to your word. And above all, we're praying that Christ will be exalted before us, that our hearts will be drawn to him from this world. Bless us to this end, Lord. May you accept our worship, and may you give us wisdom and understanding. For we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, we have been studying this idea of being blessed. Uh, last time we were together, we began with understanding uh, what it means to be cursed. We briefly talked about what it means to be cursed, and we showed how being cursed and uh, having a woe upon us are in many ways the same thing, or they can be applied the same way. Uh, we, when we talked about a woe, we were talking about having a hope that is not really a hope for good, but it is a false hope. When, whenever there is a woe upon a person, it represents hope of destruction, hope mm -hmm. of something terrible. And oftentimes you'll find in the Bible that God says that there is a woe upon you. Specifically, Matthew chapter 23, Christ identifies that there is always a woe upon hypocrisy. And that just means that if we know to do right, but we don't do that, or if we are not living up to the life that we know, or we have a high profession, but are, there are no corresponding works, then there lives a woe upon us. And oftentimes we are aware of woe. We know that the end is coming. We know that it will not be good in the end. That is not God's desire. In other words, God does not want it to be a woe upon us. He does not want us to be cursed. Uh, when you see curses in the Bible, curses in the Bible are often associated with one who has a duty who neglects the duty. Let me give you an example. If you ever read about tithe and offering. What does the Bible say when we neglect that duty of tithe and offering? What happens to us? We become cursed with a curse. So I'm just giving you that example just to brought as you, as you consider these topics and go back and study them, you'll see that these things are associated with specific experiences. You don't ever want to have duties in your life that you leave neglected or unfulfilled. Why? Because that leaves a curse upon the individual. And the curse doesn't necessarily mean that a bad thing is going to happen. A curse often represents that in not fulfilling the duty, the bad thing has already happened. Did you catch that? In other words, sometimes people look and say, well, I didn't do that. I neglected that. So now I'm cursed. So now a bad thing is going to happen. Not necessarily. The curse was not fulfilling the duty. The blessing was actually in doing what God asked you to do. So when it is neglected, that actually represents the curse. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so we're going to look at a couple of these things again in the Bible. First, I think it's important to begin with a promise on this topic, especially. Let's go in our Bible to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, and we're going to look at Deuteronomy 23. Deuteronomy 23. We're going to show how all of these things are directly tied to the final crisis. Brothers and sisters, we are, in many ways, waiting for the next big event. And the next big event, as far as we are concerned, is what? Sunday law. Sunday law. What precedes that event? Close of probation, okay. There was something else I was actually looking for. Natural disasters. Natural disasters. That these are right, but there's something else I was looking for. Maybe this is not a good question. Jesus standing up. Jesus standing up? Nope. Uh, image. I'm asking the image of the beast must be formed. Okay, so what precedes the Sunday law is the image of the beast. We're told in council that this is our test. Okay? Now that's biblical. Okay? It is biblical that the image of the beast will precede these experiences. When you look at 2 Thessalonians, the Bible says, before that day comes, what must come first? Falling away. A falling away, which represents apostasy in the Bible. Okay? The image of the beast represents apostate. Protestantism. Mm -hmm. 
Let me just write protest. So this idea ultimately is the same as falling away. I always said while we were uh, talking about, you know, the time when everyone was saying the protest is over. And I was thinking about that deeply. And I said, you know, the sad part is, is that we focused on that protest so much. And the reason why I said that was sad, because the reality is, do you know, brothers and sisters, that the protest first affects our life? We are to protest Rome. But did you know? It doesn't make sense to protest Rome when my life is out of order. In other words, when I live by my own laws, just like the Romans do, when I have my own belief system, just like the Romans do, while I'm saying I'm protesting against Rome, in my own life, I'm not protesting against sin. I'm not protesting against gluttony, idolatry, lying. You know, you understand what I'm saying? In other words, we are protesting another power when we are just as guilty as the power. It doesn't make sense. The greatest protest is actually against sin. Of course it's against Rome, but it's against Rome because Rome is also the man of sin. Let's not protest Rome while we excuse ourselves of the apostasy of the evil. So as we get to this idea, as I said, this is where our focus is. Why? Because this is just before the next major event that will ultimately determine, as our elder said, close of probation. A practical way to describe the close of probation is after that time, you will remain who you want to be. I hope you caught that. You will remain who you want to be. Whoever you are. That's who you have wanted to be, and that will be who you will be for the rest of your life. It is before this time that we are to make things right with God. It is before this time where we are to make sure we have the character of Christ. Okay. Now, let's look at these verses here to kind of put all these things together. We're looking in Deuteronomy 23, and I want to start in verse... Five, because I think it's going to give us a little bit of hope about this idea of living with a curse. The, 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 the conclusion is we don't have to live with a curse. No. We're not stuck like this. So the Bible says in Deuteronomy 23 and verse 5, it says, Nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken unto Balaam, but the Lord thy God, notice, turned the what? Curse. Curse into a what? Blessing, Blessing unto thee. Is it possible for God to turn a curse into a blessing? Yes. 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 That gives you and I hope, brothers and sisters. Yeah. That means that we are not bound to live a life, a cursed life. Yeah. If God has the ability to turn a curse into the blessing, the next question <coughs> is, how does he do it? Yeah. How does he do it? In other words, if you look at your life and you see things in your life, that makes it very clear that you are living a cursed life, then you need to say, Lord, how do I allow for you to change a curse into a blessing? Well, if we keep reading this verse, it says here, I'll read it again. Nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken unto Balaam, but the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee. And it says here, notice, because the Lord thy God loved thee. So the way that a curse is turned into a blessing, that experience begins with recognizing what? God's love. God's love. The role that God's love has in this experience allows for the change. Now, how does this apply to you and I? Well, let's look at some basic texts we already know, but we may not have been aware that all along, God's desire was to change a curse into a blessing. Mm -hmm. that, that is the reality we live in. You accepting the gospel was God saying, I'm going to turn a curse into a blessing. Let's see this in the Bible. Let's go to John chapter 3. We know these verses. But we're just going to look at some basic verses, okay? Before we try to get into some deeper things. John chapter 3. Verse 16, let's go ahead and read this verse. 
And we're going to see something very important. And that is, if you don't get rid of the curse, as I said, there's a woe upon you. But really, we're going to see that that woe ultimately represents destruction. The Bible tells of a people who are living and waiting for destruction. The Bible refers to them as children of wrath. That means that no matter what, they're going to be destroyed. Have you ever heard someone say about a kid, like, you're just going to be hard-headed. Or you're just going to be bad. And then when they look at the kid, they don't look at the kid with any hope of a better future. They look at the kid and they see how the kid is acting and they say, this kid is going to be terrible when he gets older. Could that be said about us in our Christian experience? In other words, the people don't just look at kids and just say that they're bad, do they? There's a witness. In other words, they watch the kid and the kid is consistently stubborn, continuing to do bad. That's what leads people to look at that child and say, this kid is just going to learn the hard way. This kid is going to be bad for the kid. Could that be said about our Christian experience? As you look at your life, is there a history of doing good where one could look and say, this person is going to be saved or is it the opposite? We can only answer that question for ourselves. And we must answer that question soon because, again... This is where we are headed, brothers and sisters. But what we often forget is that this is preparation for the Sunday law. In other words, people who receive the mark of the beast at the Sunday law are ready and prepared to receive the mark of the beast. We like to think that everybody's going to be there standing and fighting and saying, I'm going to resist it. That's not how it works, brothers and sisters. The Bible doesn't illustrate that. When the Bible talks about this experience coming, when you read about it, you'll see a religious movement. You see very little resistance, as a matter of fact. So you have to say, Lord, where, where do I stand? Where do I fit in that? Well, do you know that today you can already determine whether or not you would accept the mark of the beast at this point? Some of us like to believe, I, I will see how it is when it comes. But there are things right now that can be in our life that gives already witness or evidence of what happens here. Are you surprised when a bad kid turn, grows up to be terrible? Think about it. You see a kid, they were always hard-headed. 10, 15 years later, you hear about him in jail. Are you surprised? No. You're like, man, that kid was terrible. I knew, I knew he was, I knew it was going to be bad because he was bad. In other words, we reason from cause to effect and we identify that, man, this kid is just showing the fruits of what he always were. We do the same thing for a kid that's intelligent, that, you know, uses their time wisely. We say, man, this kid is... This kid is going to grow up and be something big. We already do that in real life. But when it comes to our Christianity, guess what? We act as if that principle doesn't apply. We think that we can live however we want. And then somehow when we read the 144,000, we get excited. Like, man, it's going to be nice. And that's a false reality, brothers and sisters. So as we look at this, remember, God's desire is actually to turn a curse into a blessing. This is what has been happening this whole time. You hearing the gospel, Sabbath after Sabbath, you having opportunities to study the Bible, to learn of Jesus, is God trying to change the reality. He's literally trying to do that. Everyone is not going to respond. Everyone is not going to respond. The Bible says here, John chapter 3, Verse 16, the beginning of turning a curse into a blessing begins with recognizing God's love. What happens when we recognize God's love? What is supposed to take place when you recognize God's love? Well, the Bible says, for God so loved the world, notice, 
that he gave his only begotten son. Wait a minute. So we can be more specific now. God seeks to change a curse into the blessing by giving. I hope you caught that. Yes, it is by God's love, but in showing God's love, we are able to identify giving. Did you know you can in many ways summarize the plan of salvation with the word giving? Did you also know that you can summarize your experience in the plan of salvation as also giving? Every step along the way, you'll be able to conclude that it works out because someone gave something. Now, the hard part is, you're trying to, or God is seeking to bring us into an understanding of this idea of giving to people who are selfish. It's a hard concept. Many people get stuck up on the idea of having to give money. Do you know the gospel teaches us that we actually have to give all? You have the great majority that are stuck on the money issue. How much do I have to give when the Bible actually teaches you have to actually give everything? Now, we're going to see, brothers and sisters, that the reason why God says that is because God understands that whatever you hold back is an idol. So you can say, well, there's things that I don't want to give up if you want to. But it represents idolatry. I'm reminded, this is not our study, but do you remember when God was bringing his people back into right relation? And he says, well, before we move forward, take all of the gods that are in your ears. Those gods of gold. And they begin to describe their lifestyle. And he says, all of that you have to actually give up. In that request, they were actually changing religions, brothers and sisters. They did not fully realize what they were involved with. But if you really consider, you know, the earrings that they had. You know, in the Bible that a hole in the ear represents slavery. So those earrings simply just represented that they were committed to another religion. That's all it represented. And God was saying, if you're going to be committed to a new religion, then there has to be some changes made. This is the same thing for us. What God was really doing for them was removing the curse, brothers and sisters. So we should not be surprised when God says there needs to be changes made. Changes in how you eat, how you dress, how you live, how you speak, how you spend your money. How you spend your time. All of those changes that are being made is God actually trying to change a curse to a blessing. The unfortunate part is some of us have grown comfortable with the curse. Some of us have begun to enjoy living a cursed life. I kid you not. Where we believe it's better this way. God is trying to show us it is not. The verse finishes by saying that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Notice, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. So wait a minute. Usually when we think of a woe, we look towards the future, right? Right? But what God wants us to be clear on is if there's a wall upon us, we are already in bad shape. In other words, he says one doesn't have to look all the way to the end for condemnation. The fact that right now they have not made the right decision, they are condemned already. Remember what we said earlier. It's not a curse because you just didn't do it per se. It's a, curse. it's a curse because what God had given you has been rejected. So it's not so much the end result that is the curse. The curse is not receiving the blessing, brothers and sisters. God is trying to do so much for us. We don't realize that when God actually asks us to give, he's actually blessing us. We forget. You remember what Christ said? It is more blessed. To what? 
Give them to receive. We believe that the blessing is in the receiving. But God says the blessing is actually in the giving. Now, why is this such a hard thing to receive? Well, because of our natural condition. We're not talking about earthly reality. We are talking about a spiritual reality. Understand. This principle that it is more blessed to give than to receive is a spiritual principle. Did you catch that? It doesn't make sense in the earth, brothers and sisters. That is not the earthly way to do things. Now, before I finish reading here, I was just sharing this with Elder Chris, but I wanted to bring it back to your minds. I read this to you all before, but I wanted to read it to you again. This is coming from Christ's Object Lessons 370, paragraph 1. Listen closely. Now, we're going to finish up in the Bible, but we're going to actually see, brothers and sisters, that when God finishes his, finishes his work, he does it by giving again to the world. He's already given Christ, but God, before he closes and ends everything, there's one more thing that he's going to give to the world. Do you know what it is? Christ again. All of you. I hope you caught that. Yes, there's one more thing that God is going to give to the world before the world ends, and that is you. You mean our, our lives? His His people. Do you think they're going to be accepted? Did they accept Christ or did they reject Christ? You see, ultimately, what brings the world to its end is the rejection. Of the blessing that God offers. It's going to happen again. They did not receive Christ. Do you know Christ says. If they have done it unto me. What is he? How does he end? They're going to also do it to you. What does that mean? That means that in the end. Just like I was given to the world. My father, are going, my father will give you to the world. But they will also reject the blessing. They will choose the curse over the blessing. Listen to this. This is a practical way to understand what we're discussing. This is coming from Christ Object Lessons 370, paragraph 1. It starts with, after relating the parable. Okay. It says, after relating the parable, Christ says, the children of this world are wiser in their generation. Pardon me, are in their generation wiser than the children of light. That is... Worldly wise men display more wisdom and earnestness in serving themselves than do the professed children of God in their service to God or to him. Did you catch that? Was God saying that, uh, you know, what they're doing is good? No. He was saying the earnestness. When you look at these businessmen, I don't know if you've ever met businessmen that are about their business, brothers and sisters. Listen. They are so zoned in into what they're doing. They can't fail. They're just zoned. I've met few Christians that are that way. To where everything is associated with this. These businessmen, whatever they do, is associated with their business. When they make a decision on how they spend their time, on where they go, how they spend their money, everything they do, they make it in reference to their business. But when it comes to Christians, are we making every decision in reference to the coming of Christ? Or is it still, well, Chapman, this is what I want to do. This is what I think is best. Or am I making plans and ambition, ambitious for myself and not the kingdom of God? That's really the question. It finishes by saying here. So it was in Christ's day. So it is now. She says, look at the life of many who claim to be Christians. Last night we were on the conference line doing a study on the most expensive mass. And we were showing how this just represents how many are going to take the costume of being Christians and spend their life buying it. In other words, they're going to be lost in the end, but they just wanted to look like a Christian. 
costume. There's some masks that cost $1,000. But when you really think about it, someone who puts on the costume of a Christian who doesn't really live as a Christian has really purchased the most expensive costume. They purchased it with their life. It was a waste. They were a Christian in this world, but for what value? Just to die in the end. As we read this, she's showing us here that this is a common experience. There are many who say they're a Christian, but it's not so. She finishes by saying here, the Lord has endowed them with capabilities and power and influence. He has entrusted them with money that they may be co-workers with him in, great, in the great redemption. Listen to this, she says. All his gifts are to be used in blessing humanity. Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. All the gifts God gives us are to be used doing what? Blessing humanity. blessing humanity. Or we've identified that means giving to others. It says here, in relieving the suffering and the needy. She says we are to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to care for the widow and the fatherless, to minister to the distressed and downtrodden. She says God never meant that the widespread misery in the world should exist. He never meant that one man should have an abundance of the luxuries of life while the children of others should cry for bread. Now here's where she makes it practical. This is where it hurts, brothers and sisters. She says the means... Over and above the actual necessities of life. Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. The money that we have over and above the actual necessities of life, she says, are entrusted to man to do good to bless humanity. Mm -hmm. Now, how many Christians are there really? Mm -hmm. Above and beyond. You see, things like this really help us to see that we eat bad. I'm not saying we eat bad things, but that we eat bad in the sense of some of the things that we're buying represent a luxurious diet. Because it's, it's well beyond what we need to actually survive, to just have health. We want the extras, brothers and sisters. We don't realize that we don't believe that it is more blessed to give than to receive. We believe that it's more blessed to receive. We're going to show that that is actually Satan's ideology. As a matter of fact, this is Satan's issue in heaven. I will be like God. He did not realize that God was a God who gives. When it came to giving, he recognizes that he doesn't want to be like God anymore. He wants to be Satan. Is that the case for God's people? That when we recognize that we have to give more than we want to, we don't want to be Christians anymore. Is that the case, brothers and sisters? The last part of this statement before we go to the Bible and close, she says, The Lord says, sell that ye have and give alms. Be ready to distribute, willing to communicate. When thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the halt, the lame, the blind. Loose the bands of wickedness, undo the heavy burdens, let the oppressed go free, break every yoke. Deal thy bread to the hungry. And it goes on and on. And just so that you know, these are all Bible verses. She's giving witness after witness of what true Christianity looks like. True Christianity in the end of time is not church going, brothers and sisters. Amen. It looks more like giving to others. Mm. Let's close in the Bible. The Bible says here, if you go to the book of Proverbs, let's go to Proverbs 19. If someone asks, are you a Christian? The average church goer would say, of course I'm a Christian. But if somebody came and says, have you been giving? We may not have the same response. We may not be so ready to say, Sure, I'm giving. As a matter of fact, if we go back to our life, we may see a few times where we gave something. We may find, brothers and sisters, that we have been setting up our whole life to be on the receiving end of it. We have to examine ourselves. Do we really look like Christ in the end of time is the question. 
The Bible says in Proverbs 19 here. Proverbs 19, I want to jump down to verse 7. I'm sorry, not verse 7, verse 17. The Bible says here, Proverbs 19 and verse 17, it says, He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, mm -hmm. and that which he hath given, notice, will he pay him again. again. I've had some really close friends in life. And I remember in some of these experiences as I'm talking to them about some issue that's going on, some of the really good ones will be like, whoa, 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 I know you're not about to ask me for some money. I'm talking about close friends, brothers and sisters. I was not about to ask them for anything. I'm just telling them, they ask me how I'm doing. Man, I've got to do this, do this, this, take care of this. And in the process, they're like, wow, whoa, 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 wait. I know you're not going to ask me for no money, right? Close friends. It's hard for us to give, brothers and sisters. Just think about it. If it's hard for us to loan, it's much harder to give. Many people will say that they are givers, but you can't ask them for a loan. Yet they will think, I will give as much. No, 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 no. If you won't even loan, you are surely against giving. I'm saying all this so that we can begin to look inward and just really consider as far as God is concerned. Christianity is directly associated with giving. Money is a part of it, but brothers and sisters, many are more stingy with their time than their money. And they're very stingy with money. Hey, can you, oh, uh, on that day, I got to. And really, brothers and sisters, you know what I've learned about life? We like to make sure we have extra time to do whatever we want. It's very rare that you come across people that are so busy that they don't have no time. When we say we don't have no time, we say just like we're saying it just like we use money. People say, can I have some money? We say, I don't have any money to give. That doesn't mean we don't have any money. It's just that the money that we have, we've allocated to the things we want it allocated to. We're the same way with time. When people say, I don't have time, that doesn't mean they don't have time. You know why? Because humans have a tendency to make time for themselves. How do I know? Because we have a tendency to spend money on ourselves. We use time and money the same way. And for both of those, God says, are you willing to give? I want to share two more texts in closing. Go with me in your Bibles to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 2. In verse 14. You know, brothers and sisters, when I read about Judas, I never thought myself to be like Judas. Why? Because in my mind, I'm like, listen, I'm going to be real. I'm not going to be faking it around Jesus. But as I begin to look at Judas more, I began to see that for Judas, it wasn't just the idea of being fake. Because for Judas, he actually thought his way of thinking was reasonable. Did you know that? Judas wasn't, we, we paint the picture of Judas as if he's in the background looking like, oh yeah, I'm going I'm to get all the money. That's not how it was, brothers and sisters. Judas was a man of money. He had dealt with finances throughout his life. He was very wise and actually good with money. He was just being him nat his natural self. He's like, these guys, they, that's why they're, they're broke fishermen. Right. Because they don't know what to do with money. And look at this Christian Christ God. How are you going to save the world without money? He looked at him and he thought his opinion of how things should be was actually the best way. He did not realize that Christ was actually a rich man that gave up everything. Mm -hmm. Do you know if yeah. Judas knew that, he would have probably said, I don't want to follow you. A rich man that gives up all his money for the poor? No, 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 no. That doesn't make sense to me. That would have been Judas' conclusion. And brothers and sisters, it's the same for us. A lot of the things that are taking place, they don't fit into our Christianity because it doesn't make sense. 
And really, it just means that we're not looking for God's will. Somewhere in our Christian experience, I just want it to be the way Chapman wants it to be. I just want it to be the way I want it to be. Many of us are managing our Christian experiences that very way. But the reality is, that's just continuing to hold the curse, brothers and sisters. The Bible closes here. We want to look at these last two verses. Titus chapter 2. I want to read here in verse 14. The verses I'm reading have to do with Christ's example. And what you will find, brothers and sisters, as you go through Christ's example throughout the scriptures, one of the things you will always see associated with what Christ is doing, he always summarizes his entire experience on the earth as giving. Did you know that? All through the scriptures. He summarizes his example, his experience with the word, I was given. I was given. Well, Christ, what were you doing for sinners? I was giving for the sinners. Well, what were you doing to redeem? I was giving to redeem. Every single place you look at what Christ is doing, his answer is, I was given. How does your Christianity look is the question. It says in verse 14, speaking of Christ, after talking about the blessed hope and waiting for the coming of Christ, it says in verse 14, it says, notice, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify himself, purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. What did Christ do for you? He gave himself. He gave himself for you. One more verse. Go to Timothy. We're already here. Let's look in uh, 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2. There are so many verses that show this. We already read John chapter 3 and verse 16, but there are so many other verses. The Bible says here in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. Verse 6 says, notice, who did what? Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time over and over and over. The example of Christ is an example of giving, brothers and sisters. I just encourage you today, as we close out this small, very small series, really, to challenge your Christianity. To really challenge your Christianity. What makes you a Christian? Is it your profession? Is it your church going? What makes you a Christian is to say, is to say what makes you like Christ? Is it your church going that makes you like Jesus? Is it your church going that makes you like the Son of God? Is it your profession that makes you like Jesus? As far as the Bible is concerned, Christ was our example which lets you and I know that our giving is what makes us like Jesus. We need to be giving to others. Our time, our effort. We need to be in this world working to serve others, brothers and sisters. Amen. What is the focus of your gospel experience is the question. I pray that you would allow God to turn a curse into a blessing. How will he do it? It is more blessed to give than to receive. In other words, God associates blessings with giving. The way he turns a curse into a blessing is by giving. So for us, the way we turn curses into blessings and the life of someone else who is having a cursed experience, you know how you're going to help them? You have to give them something, brothers and sisters. I encourage you to follow the example of the lovely Jesus. May we give something for the cause of God. Amen. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come to you and we are seeking to understand practically how to be a Christian. And what we're finding, Lord, is that what you require of us is the same as the rich young ruler. He said, I have the commandments. I got them. I know the law of God. I don't have to worry about the mark of the beast because I am a commandment keeper. But when you asked him to give, 
his desire to follow you was vanquished. And Lord, we're beginning to see better that in order for our church to be a working church, in order for our church to be an organized church, we will all have to give a lot more. Lord, this can be also stated as we will have to avoid the curse. The curse is really in not being a blessing and not giving. As you said to Abraham, I will bless thee and thou shalt be a blessing. Lord, the reason you bless us is so that we can be a blessing to the world, to others. We're praying that we would take that promise because that promise to Abraham was fulfilled in the gospel com commission to the disciples and it will be fulfilled in our experience today. You have blessed us to be a blessing to others. So my appeal is for the one who says, Lord, if I am honest, I would have to say that I have been selfish. And I may not have been selfish in the sense of I haven't given anything. But I may be selfish in the sense of I give what I want to give. I don't give all. Lord, we need your wisdom and guidance. It is a hard thing to hear that above our necessities. For life. That the rest that we have is to be used to do good? Lord, we need your help. Self always arises when the gospel disagrees with his plans. We want to be reminded, Lord, that we are here for you. We have truly been saved to serve. We have, called to, we have been called to be lights. Lord, we don't want to be the rich young rulers, the Laodiceans, the ones who are rich and increased with goods, to hear your call and then to turn away because we don't want to give enough. But we want to forsake all. We want to give all to build up your kingdom. Understanding we are in the living in the last days, we want to show it by our faith. Our faith and works together, Lord. We need your help. My appeal is for that one who says, Lord, I need your help. I want to follow the example of Christ truly. And I need your wisdom how to do things so that I can do things reasonably, wisely. But my decision is to give all to you, Father. Heavenly Father, you see the hearts of your people. I pray that your people have decided firmly that all that they have belongs to thee. And that in you blessing them, that they will be a blessing to others. May we recognize the fulfillment of the fourth angel will be when your glory will fill the whole earth. Because, Lord, you will be glorified in the experience of your people giving their life for the world. Christ will be seen again. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be a part of that experience in the end of time. We thank you for this opportunity to surrender our hearts, to surrender our lives, and everything that comes with us, we give to thee this day. We ask also that you would forgive us of all sin, of all selfishness. In any way we have squandered our talents or buried our talents, we want to trade them, as it were, in our present time, so that in the judgment, we can be accounted worthy and righteous. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for your forgiveness. And in Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen.